Hello, and welcome back once again to the Sages Library. <laughs> um, I am, as always, your <laughs> intrepid sage, Trevor DeVal. Thank you for joining me here in the library. Today, we're going to be talking about a game that is somewhat controversial in some circles. In every game I've ever run or played, there's something about it that I have glommed onto and said, yes, this aspect is super cool. This, this is great. Well, the game we're going to be talking about today has so, so many great things to it. And yet I've never been able to say that I love it as much as I desperately want to. The game we're talking about today is Burning Wheel by Luke Crane. This edition is the gold edition, was released I think in 2011. There was a preceding edition or two actually, I think, maybe Burning Wheel Revised, doesn't matter. We're talking about the gold edition. This is the kind of the standard edition now, the, the most recent edition. This is quite a game. I can tell you that this tome, and it is in fact a tome, clocks in at over 580 pages. This is chock full of all the goodness. And also not necessarily the goodness, but we'll come to that. This book, I'm amazed, is still in one piece because of the number of times I have hurled it across the room in frustration while trying to learn it. And that is true. It's probably why I have three copies. <laughs> I see such amazing potential in this game, but I will say, Burning Wheel, you absolutely have to have the right group of players. You absolutely have to have a group that fully buys into what this game is trying to do. And what is that? Well, this is a game that basically, and I don't mean to, this to sound insulting at all, because it's not. This is a game that tries to mechanize everything, including role-playing. Now that sounds pretty crazy, especially, especially to you old school uh, types out there. You know, back in the day when we were playing in the you know 70s and 80s, the idea of a social conflict didn't really have mechanics to go with it. If anything, you had a high charisma, let's say, and, uh, you know, there was a reaction role that was made that was modified by that high charisma. And if, you know, if you got a good role, then that person you were speaking to would be favorably disposed to you. But as time went on, people realized that conflicts could be more than just violent. That there, there could be all kinds of conflicts. There could be social conflicts. There could be emotional conflicts. This game mechanizes all of it. And that can seem off-putting, but what I love about what this game tries to do is that it basically says, look, we are trying to create an experience where you are playing a fully fleshed out, living, breathing character who has very, very, very specific beliefs that they are pursuing, goals, if you will. And they will challenge everything about their person. They will challenge every belief they have. They will challenge everything they are in order to achieve those goals. In essence, it's, it's basically drama 101. You know, you've got a character who needs to overcome an obstacle and that creates drama. Well, this game tries to mechanize that and it succeeds. Mostly. This is a game that is a well-oiled machine. It is a well-oiled wheel, actually. The, symbol, uh, the symbolism that the, the author uses is the wheel uh, revolving around the hub and the spokes of the wheel that are the various different sort of subsystems and things like this. But this is a game that if you allow yourself to be swept along by its mechanics, by its rules, and if you do not deviate from those rules, it will work for you. However, however, I have found that in my experience, this is a game that if you allow yourself to go along with the rules and really internalize those rules and follow them essentially to the letter of the law, you will have a very interesting experience. My problem with the game at the beginning was I felt that it wasn't immersive. I felt that because of the mechanical crunch involved in everything you do, not just a combat, but in everything you do, I'm trying to convince the local lord to let me court his daughter, let's say. Well, that is a, 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 a skill challenge that must be rolled for. And that's all great. I love that. But coming from the old school, we sort of assume that playing your character doesn't always necessarily have to have a correlating dice roll associated with it. But this game basically says, no, anything that's important, you must roll for. Again, it's not a criticism, it's just the way the game is. And it rubs a lot of old school players the wrong way. In a social situation, 
it was sort of left up to the players to kind of play their characters and let it, you know, uh, play out as it will. You'll hear a lot of old guys like me talk about, oh, it was great. You know, we had a session. It was a six hour session and not a single die was rolled the whole time. That is anathema to Burning Wheel. The idea of not rolling a dice in Burning Wheel is, is just completely alien. In fact, if you don't roll dice in Burning Wheel, you're actually doing it wrong. <laughs> a lot of my players found that this game pushed against their own role-playing instincts. They wanted to create a character, and they wanted to play the character a certain way, but they found that the game itself was basically fighting them. For example, when you create a character in this game, you go through a variety of life paths. Now, that's really cool. I love life paths game, like... Uh, like um, Traveler is a great example of that, where you go through this series of life paths and you basically chart the progression of your character's life up until the current point. I love that stuff. It's great. Well, this game does that too, except that this game is far more channeling than something like Traveler. In Traveler, you could decide, I'm going to try to become a member of the Marines out of my merchant career, and you've got a good chance of doing that. But in Burning Wheel, it's much harder to do that. You feel a, a lot of the time like Luke, the author is grabbing you by the nostrils and saying, no, this is the character you're going to play. <laughs> and if you trust that process, it can be really cool. But if, if you don't, you're going to be chafing against it all the time. So let's talk about something really, really basic. This game is all about dice rolls, as I've mentioned. It's all about tests, dice tests. It's all about rolling your skills or your stats and overcoming an obstacle to achieve a thing. This is the absolute lifeblood of this system. If I want to do anything of importance whatsoever to my character, I'm going to roll my dice pool. It's, it's a basic d6 dice pool system. Very, very simple on the face of it. And the, I'm going to say, I want this. I'm going to, I'm going to say to the GM, my character does this, and, the, and I'm going to explain my intention. And so the GM might say, okay, well, how do you intend to do that? Well, I'm going to court the Lord's daughter by using my seduction skill, let's say. Okay, great. So then the GM says, here's what's going to happen if you are successful. This set of circumstances is going to happen. But if you fail, there's going to be a complication. And maybe the GM will tell you what that is. Maybe maybe he won't. But the, the point is, is that the players always are given the option to not roll if they choose. Now, that's quite fundamentally different from the way a lot of games are sort of traditionally run, where especially if you're from the sort of immersive kind of first-person perspective style of games, which not everybody is. But if you are, you're used to saying, you know, I run into the room and I do this thing and you roll for it. And if you fail, then the GM tells you what happens. But in Burning Wheel, it's pretty essential that before you roll, the GM's going to give you an idea of what the outcome could be. And there's reasons for that because failure in Burning Wheel is not only a possibility, it is a fact of life. And it is a requirement for your character to advance. This is a game about putting your character up against odds that you as the player know they cannot defeat, they cannot overcome. But the only way to truly advance your character is to intentionally put yourself up against those odds, knowing you're going to fail. Now, there are certain mitigating things you can do. There's, there's something called Artha in this game, which is basically special kind of fate points. It's it's a, a whole thing. But you are typically not going to be the kind of character that can just do everything and you have all these awesome abilities. No, you're typically going to start off being someone who is very limited. Maybe good at specifically the things you want to be good at, but, but not so great that you can, you know, breeze through a, a situation. Again, I don't want to be unfair. This is an eminently tailorable game, weirdly. You know, it's very specific about following the rules exactly. And yet at the same time, the GM has a lot of flexibility to sort of tailor the game based on, you know, what the style of game is going to be. If, if it's going to be a heavy combat dungeon crawl kind of game, would not recommend Burning Wheel for that, by the way. It's far too lethal. As opposed to a courtly intrigue game where you're, you know, wheeling and dealing with uh, nobles trying to gain influence at a court or something like that. So you, you can really choose the focus of your game, which I love. You know, and again, this idea that Burning Wheel is all about conflict in all of its many and wonderful forms, it's great. It gives you the mechanical heft to be able to portray that conflict in virtually any arena. So that's really great. But the idea that you have to accept failure into your life really rubs a lot of players the wrong way, especially my players. You want your PC, you want your character to quote unquote win. You want your character to overcome the obstacle. So the idea of intentionally having your character fail because you know that's the only way for that character to advance, 
that makes sense from a sort of dramatist kind of perspective, but it really rubs against the grain for a lot of role players who are there to essentially win. And I know that that sounds kind of silly. You can't win the role playing game other than by having fun. <laughs> like when I'm playing, if I if my character has strong objectives, I want to achieve those objectives and I'm pissed if I don't. It bugs me that I fail. Well, in Burning Wheel, you have to get used to it. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's tough for, for old men like me who are used to doing things a certain way. <laughs> so this game excels in turning everything into a conflict. Whole campaigns can be fraught with danger, tension, and intrigue, and nary a blade will ever be drawn. So I ran a Burning Wheel limited campaign a number of years ago. It was set in Harn. I'm going to do a Sage's Library about Harn. It's one of my favorite uh, game worlds but it was very, very medieval kind of setting. They were sent in to spy on behalf of this local lord uh, to spy on this, this sheriff to discover all kinds of secrets. And they decided, because of the particular backgrounds of these characters that they created, that they were going to, to create kind of a entertainment troupe, kind of like a, a, a traveling uh, show. So that's how they infiltrated the castle. And, and what emerged from it was a really, really interesting game because it was all about these characters pursuing their beliefs and pursuing their goals at the same time trying to, you know, achieve the ends of the Lord, spying on the, on the, on the captain. It was about, you know, noble intrigue. It was about courtly romance came up. It, it was about everything except for really combat. There was one fight in the whole campaign and it was a fist fight where basically one of the characters took on this knight and this knight basically punched him down. And that was it. That was the whole combat of the game. But the moments in the game, were very tense and the atmosphere of the game was still very very tense and you know we were engaging with the mechanics in order to oh i wonder what's going to happen right so it was very exciting however this leads into a criticism that i i have of the game and and honestly i don't know whether it's me doing something wrong but i don't think it is because everyone i've ever talked to about burning wheel or any burning wheel game i've ever seen played whether that's online or in real life certainly any game i've been involved with this particular phenomenon always happens at burning wheel your characters have these very, very deeply held beliefs and these goals, these agendas they're trying to pursue. So invariably, what winds up happening is in the, in the middle of a situation, the players will split, or the characters rather, will split off to pursue their own agendas and you get one player doing a thing with the GM while the rest of the table just kind of watches. And I don't know what that is. All I can think of is that because the focus of the game is so much on these characters' beliefs, the players, in order to advance, you have to pursue your beliefs and you have to challenge them and you have to fail at those challenges, basically. So, of course, they're incentivized to, to break off and do their own thing. Now, the book is very good about making sure that there's a commonly held belief among the party. That's very crucial. But even that said, I have still seen in literally every game I've ever played or run, that regardless of the shared beliefs, regardless of the shared goals of the, of the characters, they always wind up splitting off. So, if you're going to run Burning Wheel, I would say that knowing and accepting that this is going to happen, that the players are going to split up, the player characters are going to split up to achieve their own things, in order to prevent the rest of the players from feeling left out in that situation, as a GM, I would recommend that you give those other players a chance to play NPCs in the current scene that's being played focused on whatever PC it is. So if one PC is going directly to the Lord's court to talk to him about thing, to, to make a demand of him, let's say, then maybe at the Lord's court, you as a GM know, okay, well, the Lord has a daughter sitting there. And maybe there's a court advisor there. And maybe there's the chief man at arms. And all of these characters have motivations and they all have desires and they all have personalities that you as a GM have sort of fleshed out. Well, it would be an interesting thing to do to give a little, a little card, a little cue card to your other players and say, okay, okay, for this scene, you, you know, Bob, you're going to be playing Trenton, the, the man at arms, who secretly has a passion to, to court the Lord's daughter and hates anybody getting close to her. And then, you know, uh, you hand another cue card out to, to another player. It's like, hey, you're the daughter and this is what you want. So that you allow the other players at the table to take part in that scene actively. So they get to roll dice and all that kind of stuff. I think that works really great as opposed to letting the rest of the players just kind of sit there and, and, and go into watch mode, waiting for their turn. So if you can make that work, give it a shot, because when I have been part of that, it, it, it works really great. And it's just, it's super fun. 
Uh, lots of fun. So that's a tip. So the resolution system of Burning Wheel. Well, as I said before, it's a very simple D6 a dice pool system. You, you've got a skill and you're rolling a number of D6s and you've got to get a certain number on each D6 in order to count successes, just like a lot of games are. That's really basic. Where it gets complicated is in the spokes of the wheel, in the little mini games that are attached onto it. So for example, Duel of Wits. Duel of Wits is a special set of rules that allows the characters to strategically engage in a debate or even a persuasion or a conversation, something where there's something at stake for both parties and it's essential for one party to convince the other or it's essential for one party to convince a third party that they're right instead of the second party. Duel of Wits is, gr is, is, is a really interesting idea. In the Duel of Wits minigame, you basically strategize your approach. You say, okay, well, I'm going to pick three maneuvers. I'm going to taunt, and then I'm going to make a point, and then I'm going to rebut, and you, you secretly choose the maneuvers, and then once both sides have secretly chosen their maneuvers, you reveal them one at a time and resolve them as they go. Now, this sounds super cool on paper, but in reality, I find it to be hard to make work. I find it to be clunky, and I hate that I find it to be clunky, because when I read it on paper, I think, this is awesome! This is so cool! But in practice, it's tough. It's tough for a number of reasons. One, it's tough because people don't have an argument this way. People don't, when, when you're in an argument with someone, you're responding, I mean, you have a point to make, but you're also responding in the moment to what the person just said. You're not carefully planning out three steps ahead what you're going to say. You know, because, you know I mean, you might do that, but if you do that, then the person comes back with a, a totally different train of thought, which is going to derail you. Like, it's just people, it, it, feels, it feels awkward and unnatural. So that's... That's a bummer. I really wish I could I could figure it out. Maybe there's something I'm missing. I don't know, but I've tried it so many times and I've seen it happen so many times where I'm like, it just feels awkward and clunky and the pace dies. And, and, and that's the downside of trying to mechanize role playing is that you can really kill the pace of a moment of a scene, especially if you're a first person kind of uh, immersionist kind of player. Rules like this actually take away from that experience rather than enhancing it, which is a shame because I firmly believe that Luke Crane is trying to enhance your role playing experience through these rules. Then there's the combat rules. Well, the combat rules, there's basically three different ways to have a fight. One is the most basic way possible. I state my intention, I roll my dice. If I succeed, I get what I want. I kill that guy with my knife. Great, you roll, you succeed, you kill that guy with your knife. Then there's something called bloody verses. Bloody verses is a little step up from that. It basically adds in some of the weapon mechanics and armor mechanics. So now it's not quite as cut and dried as I want to do this. If I succeed, I get it. Now it's I want to do this. If I succeed, I wound him. But it's still a one roll resolution thing. For me, I like fights to be a little bit more robust than just one roll. And then you jump to the fight rules. Fight exclamation mark. And these are unbelievably complex. You basically have to go take a university course in order to understand. <laughs> How to make the fight rules work and it's possible it's totally possible but again you have to have players who are dedicated to understanding these rules and to internalizing them in order for it to have any kind of flow at the table the fight rules are so complicated and so hyper detailed that i feel there's something missing between bloody verses and fight there, there's, there's a sweet spot that isn't explored there and I've tried to explore it, I've tried to sort of cobble it together myself, but Burning Wheel really resists any house ruling. <laughs> it really does. It's got its way and, and that's the way it is. The fight rules also have the same thing as Duel of Wits, where you pick three actions, uh, strike, block, dodge, let's say, and then you reveal one at a time against your opponent's three actions. But I can tell you, as someone who fenced professionally for years and years and years, if you go into a sword fight trying to plan three moves ahead, you're going to lose that fight. <laughs> I promise you. Because a fight is not only about choosing your intention, it is as much about responding to what your opponent just did and then trying to outdo them with your next move. So this idea of doing three steps at a time, just as, again, as someone who actually had sword fights, <laughs> I mean, fencing, uh, it just feels artificial. Again, I love it on paper. I'm like, this looks like such a fun mini game. Oh, and then as soon as we sit down to do it, it just, just throws gum in the gears and the game grinds to a halt as we're all trying to figure out these rules and 
and wait a minute, but I struck, and then you strike, and I guess that's a counter strike, and then what does this mean? And nah, 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 nah. There is so much more to this game that I can possibly get into. There's the whole magic system, which itself is just an unbelievably a uh, complicated but really super cool and flavorful system. I really do like it. The range and cover rules. This is a set of rules that is specifically designed to handle a ranged fight, which honestly, I read th these rules and I think this is more suited for like a Vietnam style combat where people are running from tree to tree, firing at people, you know, uh, uh, trying to take cover while they fire pot shots. That, that kind of fight doesn't happen a lot in a typical fantasy game. It's possible, but it, it, it's pretty rare. So, so there's just a lot of outliers and, and strange things in the book that they all do fit together. It's, it's not like, you know, anything's totally extraneous. There is so much in it, uh, and, and I am afraid, and I know, <laughs> I'm afraid and I know, I will never begin to scratch the surface of what this game is capable of, mostly because it's so hard to find a group that wants to play this game. <laughs> I am a big admirer of what this game is, is trying to do. I'm a big admirer of what this game succeeds at doing. I just know that in the future, it is far more likely that I wind up hurling this book across the room again than it is me actually sitting down and playing it. So, Burning Wheel, unbelievable game, super cool, and, and as, a, as a relic of role-playing, th there is nothing out there like this, man. I mean, there is technically. There's a game called Torchbearer and Mouse Guard. They are both based on Burning Wheel. But this, this is quite something. If, if you have the patience and you have a deeply analytical mind and you've got players that really want to mechanize their, their role playing, then by all means, check this guy out. He will always have a sacred and hallowed place on these bookshelves. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for joining me. And if you want to help support this channel, you can do so by liking or subscribing and also joining us over on Patreon. Thank you so much, and we will see you next time on the next Sages Library.